And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Vinny Todd Tolman, who during his near-death experience traveled to heaven, which we're going to talk about and more. Vinny, thank you for joining me today and welcome. Thank you so much, Jeff, for having me on today. All right, Vinny, if you don't mind, let's just start on the day your NDE happened and go from there. Awesome. Well, you know, mine happened uh, quite a few years ago, but it took a long time to get it published and get it out there. And that's how the story is out there now. Um, This was back January 18th of 2003. Me and a buddy of mine, we took a supplement that we had ordered online. And this supplement had come from Thailand. and, And what we didn't realize is this supplement that was normally bought at all the different vitamin shops here in the States was a normal drink that you just take a little bottle cap worth. And, and it was a perfect weightlifting supplement to help muscle recovery happen a lot faster than normal. And we got this, this new one from online from Thailand. And uh, we couldn't read the script that was on the bottle, but we didn't realize is what came from this other country was a hundred percent solution. And what were we, we were typically using in the United States was a 5% solution. So right off the bat, it was like taking 20 bottle caps instead of one bottle cap. And, uh, you know, we both took it, we both felt instantly ill. And uh, we had we had had some experience with with other supplements that kind of irritated your stomach. And we felt, well, maybe if we go eat something, we'll feel better. So we headed down the street uh, in my buddy's car to a local fast food joint. We barely make it there. He's he's almost nodding off, and I'm like shaking him awake as we pull up and we park the car. I go running inside, go to the bathroom, lock the door. He goes inside the restaurant, and barely kind of stumbles into one of the booths, and he starts to to release or or vomit on the table there. A manager comes over, sees this going on. He calls nine one one. They get an ambulance there and they haul him away. Meanwhile, I'm in in this this public bathroom with the door locked. And I'm by myself and I'm going through the same process. But for myself, I had fallen on my back. And so I was laying on my back when I started to vomit and, and essentially I aspirated. So I literally um, uh, died right there on the floor. The last thing that I remember at this point was the room started to spin as, as everything just went dark for me. And from that dark that came over me, all of a sudden I started to see, um, kind of this image start to clear in front of me. And, and now out of nowhere, I was, I was overlooking uh, something that was going on below me. And this kind of this scene that I was seeing was the scene of a dead body on the ground. And, and I was looking from above and I could see um, all these workers in the restaurant right near the body, but just on the other side of the wall. And they had no idea. Finally, a customer came over and and uh, kind of negotiated with the manager saying, hey, I need to use this bathroom and that nobody's opening that door. It's been locked for a long time. And the manager opened that door and, and saw a dead body there and called 911. Um, another team of medics came, another team, ambulance team came. This was a team of three gentlemen, two veterans and a rookie. They get there, they pronounce the body as dead. They They take a body temperature. They attempted some some preliminary resuscitation, like chest compressions. They tried uh, pumping some some hand ventilated oxygen into the lungs, and nothing happened. So they they did pronounce the body dead. They bagged the body, they put it in in the back of the ambulance, and then they they waited for law enforcement so that, that they could get a specific signature from a police officer that they had found a um, you know somebody that had passed away. And so they waited for that police officer at the time, though, they did did record the body at 79 degrees. So, um, you know, and that was when they found the body in the process of bagging the body and waiting for the police officer. It was at least another 30, 45 minutes, um, you know, postmortem. Or, so I know for sure I was dead at least 45 minutes, if not over an hour, if not an hour and a half. So um, from all this, though, I didn't know it was me. I really didn't know it was me that I was watching because. What I was watching uh, is where I was. So there's no way that that what I was watching was me. Um, and plus, the body looked so foreign to me. It didn't look like me at that point. It looked very, very different. It looked um, so different than than I normally look, um, especially with all that had gone on with the, the suffocation and such. So I'm sitting here watching all this happen. They bag the body. They put it in the back of the ambulance. They wait for the police officer. 
the officer comes, they signs the paperwork, says you guys can go. They pull away from the scene. Now, mind you, they're going slow. They're going to go to the medical examiner locally in the county, and they're going to turn this body in. Meanwhile, I'm literally hearing the thoughts of this rookie medic who's sitting in the back of the ambulance. And he, this is his first week of work. He feels very distraught that, that nobody's really trying very hard for this guy. He feels that, that they, they just accepted that he was already dead without trying hard to, to resuscitate the body. And in, in the process of doing this, him, him thinking this, all of a sudden this, this light started to shine around his, his heart area, literally a light, like as if somebody's taking a spotlight in the middle of the day and shining it just on his heart area. And out of nowhere, this, this force, this, this really strong force goes over my left shoulder and goes, and I can actually see it going straight to him. And I hear very loud and audibly, this one's not dead. And I hear it so loud. I, I looked around like, how, how did I hear that? And I knew he heard it too. And as soon as he heard it, he looked back and looked at the medics that, that are his two veteran medics that he's working with, his trainers. And he thought, well, maybe they're trying to play a trick on me. And quickly, he, he kind of discounted it. No, that wasn't them. I was just, I was just imagining that. And they, they went about another block down the road. And all of a sudden, this glowing area around his heart, it started to expand. And it went to above his head all the way down to his waist and got brighter, like literally brighter. And, and legitimately, this light was, was like glowing from inside him. And from this, from this light glowing around him, all of a sudden, I, again, I felt this force coming over my left shoulder and this, this, this very strong force. And then I heard a second time even louder, this one's not dead. And with the second, the second time, the medic didn't even, didn't even second guess it for a minute or for a second. He, he decided that was strong enough that he needed to check the body. He needed to see if really this one's not dead. So he, now mind you, I'm, you know, the body's strapped down to the gurney, has straps all over it. Um, he undoes the, the zipper from the head up going down. And as he's doing, he has to undo a strap here. He keeps going to about mid chest. And then he started feeling around inside the body bag. And um, as he's feeling around, he, he senses like how gross and cold the body feels and how the chest was actually feeling hard at this point, like hard, like solid. Um, he's going around, he's, he's feeling, he's feeling, he can't feel anything. He felt inside the arm could also feel it was very cold and, and didn't feel anything. And his training has taught him that, you know, if you check anywhere, you check in the femur area, the femoral artery, artery is the big one inside the thigh. So that was the next spot he went. He had to undo some more straps. He went down on the inner thigh area to feel if there was any pulse down there. As he got there and, and, and put some strong pressure down, as he got there and was putting that pressure, he pushed. And, and as he was pushing through the flesh of the body, he, he made contact with the bone, the actual femur bone. And as he did, it felt like somebody shocked me where I was sitting and shocked him where he was sitting. Like I literally felt a shock, like a, like a spark, a very strong spark off of like a very strong battery or a power outlet, you know, on the wall. And he felt it too. It was enough for him that he began to take action. He, he began to take action of trying to resuscitate this cold, stiff, dead body. And it was enough for him. And, uh, you know, thank God that he did do all this because I'm here as proof that there is, there is a, additional options after we die sometimes. And um, he hooked up uh, these diodes on the chest. He did all this stuff. He had to cut the shirt off. As he was doing all this, he hooked up the diodes. And, and up until this point, the other two veteran medics weren't really aware of what was going on until the alarm went off on the defibrillator, the, the machine that shocks the heart. Once the alarm went off saying, you know, saying clear your hands, so that the body can can be charged uh, with this electricity. Um, as that alarm was going off, the two veteran medics look back and they see this guy, what he's doing. He he clipped open the shirt and it was all messy and he had the diodes out and they started just really going after him saying, 
you're an idiot. You're going to get fired. You can't do this. This guy's dead. You have to know when to let go. And they really went after him and he didn't care. He didn't care at all. He wasn't dissuaded at all. He, he kept ahead and, and went ahead and let that charge go through. It, um, it hit the body, um, no heartbeat. It didn't stop him. He went ahead and restarted the charge. He heard the alarms again. And as the second alarm's going on, again, those two veteran medics are just chewing him out. The second charge or the second, second ignition happens on the defibrillator. And when it, the second one happened, there was a single heartbeat, one heartbeat, and then flatline. But that single heartbeat was enough to get the two veteran medics to like kind of hush up and realize, hey, whoa, something's going on here. So they didn't say anything. They were just observing as he went to the third round of shocks. And at the third round of shocks, he actually got a heartbeat back, a steady, faint heartbeat, but still a, a heartbeat. And um, the miracle of it is when this all happened, they were literally a block away, one block away from a trauma center that, that specialized in cardi cardiology. So they, they got this heart started back again. Within seconds, they had the body turned over to a trauma team at a hospital who could actually do something with it. And, um, and that's, you know, a miracle upon the miracle that, that number one, here's this rookie medic. He listened to what he felt, um, you know, whether he'd say this today or not, but back then he said he felt God tell him I wasn't dead. And from my perspective, I heard God telling him that I wasn't dead. And, um, you know, again, though, from my perspective, I was watching something outside me. It was not me that I was watching. As they transferred this body from, as they transferred the body from the ambulance over into the actual hospital, as they were doing that transfer, I could see that the body was uh, starting to go through seizures and was, was like flailing around a lot. As the body was flailing around, um, the medical staff pulled out these straps and they started to strap the body down to the bed so that they could do the work that they needed to on the, on the body. And um, they strapped down the, the two legs, then they strapped down the right arm. And then as they went to go strap the left arm, it felt literally as if someone was strapping my left arm where I was sitting, watching all of this happen in front of me. And so I looked down to see why is my arm feel like it's being strapped down. And as I looked down, I realized that I, I, was, I felt like someone was restricting my arm. So I resisted it and I pulled away. I literally pulled away and I looked down to see the body do the same thing. And I saw the body actually uh, rip the strap that the, the nurse had put on the arm. So she went back and got another leg strap and actually put the leg strap on that arm and strapped it down. As she did so, I felt my own arm get strapped down. And at this point was the very first point that I knew that what I was watching was me. Up till this point, it didn't look like me. It really didn't look like me. It looked so different than me. The face was purple. The neck was really wide. It was like wider than a normal neck. It had swollen um, wider, almost as I would say even wider than the jaw of the, of the head. It didn't look human even. It looked almost fake. And as all this is going on, this is the first notion that I have that what I've been watching this whole time was me. And as soon as that, that, that dawned on me, it started to hit me like, you're the idiot. How did you not know that this whole time you were watching your own death, your own body? Like, how is it you not know that that's your own body? It's you're wearing your own clothes. I mean, I know it didn't look like you, but hello, it was wearing everything you're wearing that day. But it, but I, I, it didn't dawn on me until that point. As I was thinking these negative thoughts, I, I caught like a glimmer or a glimpse of all the negative things I'd ever done in my life. And I caught a glimpse of how, not only how it affected those that I did it to, but how it affected me and how it affected, how it changed them and how, how they changed from it. And it, it was almost like I was able to see all the negative chain reactions that I put into motion in my life. And then out of, out of the right side of my countenance, I started to feel this warmth and, and the warmth curved around to my back. And, and all of a sudden, this, all this warmth started to take over me um, from behind and moving forward. As it did, I started to recollect all the good things I did in my life. 
And I actually started to see the chain reactions of, you know, when I did something really good, how it affected somebody and how they did really good. And, and I got to see it from, from their perspective and my perspective. And I got to see kind of the inside and out of my existence and how, how much of an impact I had for the good as well as the bad. And what I realized is I did have a lot of good impact in my life, even though I was, a, I was 25 years old when this happened. And I, I had had some success financially and by the world standards, some, some major successes, but, but ethically I had not had a lot of major successes. I'd had a few, but not a lot. And, and it really woke me up. It woke me up to the fact that no matter our incomes, no matter what we're able to accomplish in the physical world, that stuff doesn't count that it counts that we make a difference in other people's lives. And, and as I, I started to come about with this, this energy, this warmth, it overtook me. And I realized it was coming from behind me, this light, this warmth. And so I turned around, I turned around to see, I turned around to see this old guy and um, he was all dressed in white. He had uh, white pants and a white shirt and like a white robe with, uh, kind of a um, a stole or or kind of a a robe looking thing on his shoulders. He had very very pink skin. His skin was so pink um, it glistened like literally light was coming out of it. He he almost had kind of a Santa Claus type look. Long white beard, long white hair. And as I saw him, my first instinct was that he must be God. And as soon as I even thought that, he started to chuckle. And he, he just like shook his head and he's like, he's like, no, son, I'm, I'm not God. And, you know, I was raised Christian. And so my next assumption is that he must be Christ. He must be Jesus Christ. So I thought that as soon as I thought that he, he shook his head and smiled again, said, no, son, I'm not Jesus Christ. Um, he says, I'm here to be your guide. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you go wherever you want to go but I'm here to, to help you go wherever you feel drawn. And my name is Drake. He says, says literally, my name is Drake. You can call me Drake. And so I, I, I recognize that he's here for me as my guide and I embrace his energy. And um, there was no question. I didn't want to go back to where that body was. That body looked like hell to me. It literally looked like hell to me. What that body was going through was not something that I wanted. So I, I fully embraced Drake and his energy and said, well, I want to go wherever you're going. Wherever you're going, that's where I want to go. I don't want to go back to that body. And he said, well, great. This is, this is going to be an adventure. This is going to be very um, enlightening and exciting. And he explained to me that it wasn't going to be just a, a traveling from point A to point B that we weren't just going to go from a physical point to another physical point, but we were going to go from a lower density to a higher density or a lower frequency to a much higher frequency. So we weren't just going to be traveling distances. We were going to be raising our frequency or raising our density um, to be a, a much, much higher frequency being to go where we were going to go. And so I, I agreed with them and I said, let's do it. Let's, let's go where we need to go. And it's really kind of funny because at this point I was kind of cocky. I was raised Christian and, and in my church that, that I was raised in, um, I thought that, you know, everybody in my church had like this special escalator to heaven that, you know, everybody in our church would just get on this escalator and you go straight to heaven that, you know, everything you'd done up to this point, it was so good that you must get the fast track to heaven. And, um, and he kind of laughed at this whole idea that somehow there was a fast track to heaven. And he explained to me that, no, that there's not a fast track, but there is um, a path. And he was here to help me go on this path. So I willingly and lovingly said, hey, let's do it. Let's go on this path. So we go on this, we, we begin our journey. And again, this journey, it's, it's not from just point A to point B. It's to, to lower worldly understandings to higher eternal universal understandings and one of the first things that i was taught i was essentially taught 10 major principles as i went from earth to heaven and and in that process of learning these 10 principles the first one was authenticity i i 
I thought I was already a pretty authentic person. He, he helped explain to me that I wasn't, that I was very inauthentic. Even though I thought I was authentic, I, I had a different version of myself that I allowed to come out at work. I had a different version of myself that I allowed to come out when I was at church or with my mom or with certain friends. I allowed a different version of myself to come out and they weren't the same version. And he, he helped me understand that until I could take all these different versions of me and make them the same being, make them the same me, then I wasn't being authentic. And so he helped me with that. He helped me understand the reason why I was bringing out a different side of my personality for different people is because for some reason I thought it protected me. Some reason I thought it kept people from ridiculing or separating me from the herd. And so I did, I, I kind of got along to play along type uh, energy with my own personality with whoever I was with at the time. And I, and I, and it was more of like a survival mechanism. I was, I was raised in a family where, where you either sunk or you swam and, and over survival, I, I decided to always try to swim and, and make my, make my way out of situations. And so I did, I, I built an inauthentic version of myself. And, and here was the center of all these different aspects of me. And the center of that was who I really was. And he showed me that. And, and that was the first principle that I had to be authentic before I could do anything. I had to peel away all these extra versions of me, all these different versions that didn't matter. I had to peel them away to understand who I really was before I could do anything. That was the number one most important thing I had to do was to um, get to this authentic place so that I could grow. And until I could get there, I couldn't grow. I couldn't love. I couldn't grow. I couldn't progress. I had to get to my true authentic self first. And, um, and so that, that was one of the first things he, he taught me is to, to be your authentic self, that we, we have to find out who we really are. We have to take who we, you know, the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of who we are and be authentic about it. And from there we can grow from there. We can, we can progress, you know, in the process of all this, he, he taught me, um, also the power of, of, of other aspects of this life. And how if we really embody these, these aspects of, of life, we can make our life so much better. And, um, and so over the years, I actually teach these things to people, um, you know, individually, one-on-one. -on -one. I teach classes. I do that kind of stuff. I teach people about these different aspects of what I learned. Um, and I'm still perfecting what I learned in my experience and applying it literally daily as I teach other people how to do it. And, you know, one of the things that I learned is, is the power of breath work. Um, and I would love if I could do a little example of that. It's called, I call it the, the power of 333, where we just take, uh, we be very conscious with our breath. And I would love to set the intention that, that this video, um, this podcast, this media, um, get to those who need it and those who are ready for something like this. And that, that's what I set as the intention as I do. So, um, do you, are you cool if we do a three thirty three real quick? Yeah, I think it's great. I just want to let people know that if you are driving a car or operating heavy machinery or anything that could potentially be dangerous because you're distracted of what you're doing, you may want to pause this and come back to it later. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great advice. I really appreciate that, Jeff. Yeah. This is just a, a little breathing exercise. It's something you can do when you are in a safe space. You're not driving, you're not operation, operating machinery um, or operating machines. Um, but yeah, the, the 333 is the power of your breath. And it's three breaths in, three breaths out, three times. And what this does is it resets the energy of what's going on around you. It helps kind of realign your own energy and, and kind of wipes the slate clean or wipes the whiteboard clean so that you can do what you want to do with your daily life. So what I'll do is I'll, are we cool to start? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So we'll start with uh, a, a three count breath in. We'll go in two, three out two, three. In, 
out. In. Out. So it's very, very simple, but um, very effective in, in cleaning the energy. And um, it was one of the things that I was shown in my process that, that something that we have to understand is we are eternal spiritual beings and we are living in these little physical bodies here on earth. Uh, and we are literally living in a classroom, not a courtroom. We're here for learning. We're here for growing. We're here for uh, learning the powers of creation and having agency. And that's what we're here to do. And we're not here to uh, get a pass or failing grade. We're here to learn, to grow. That's it. That's the the primary thing. And and it's so important for us to understand that our our coach is God and the creator, the universe, and wants us to be able to get what we want out of life and to learn the fact that we are a divine masterwork, that we are the creators of our own universe. Literally, we are the creators of our own universe and that we have access to the holiest temple in all the universe. And it's right here between our two temples. That's the holy of holies where what, what we allow inside here is so vitally important. And um, an example I give to some of my friends is, you know, we would never show up to a dump, a garbage dump, and just start shoveling stuff in our mouth. But for some reason, when we show up to our social media, we show up to our entertainment media, we just start shovel, letting stuff get shoveled into our mouth. And it's very important that we understand that we are in control of our own universe, that we don't have to show up to the garbage dump and just let anything in. We can be very conscious of what we allow in our holy temple and what we allow our eyes, to, what we allow our ears to consume, what we allow our mouths to consume and what we allow our mouths to create with our own words with our own spelling, with, with using our words. Um, you know, this, this idea that we are the creators of our own universe, it was new to me. And, you know, Drake showed this to me that, that we are all empowered through this process, that we are not victims. We are victors. We are victorious over our, our path just to even be here, just to even show up and be here. We, we are not victims. We are victors. We can really um, get what we want out of this life as far as what, what we can grow with and what we can learn with. Um, but one of the, you know, after my guide Drake went through and taught me about authenticity, he taught me some other principles. He taught me about um, the hour of power and and if, you, if you've ever heard of the hour of power, what that is, it's, it's a way to know what your real religion is. And if someone tells me they're Christian, I say, well, what do you put in your hour of power if you're Christian? And they tell me, you know, I explain to them what the hour of power is. And then I tell them, actually, you're not Christian then. You actually worship Twitter or you worship CNN or you worship um, uh, ESPN or you worship NFL or MLB, um, the hour of power is the 30 minutes before you go to bed, the 30 to 60 minutes before bed, and the first 30 to 60 minutes right when you wake up. And whatever you allow in this hour of power, that is your religion. It is. That daily check-in before we go to bed, and that daily check-in as soon as we've woken up, that is what our religion is. And it's really important for us to understand that principle. That what we allow in that sacred space is what we are worshiping. Whether we recognize it or not, it's a fact, Jack. You know, we, that's, that's, that's a fact. That whatever we're allowing in our hour of power, that is what we're worshiping. And it's important for us to understand this principle because we get to choose what goes there. We don't have to just wake up and, you know, a lot of people allow work 
and, and business to be in their hour of power. So no matter where they go on Sunday, whether they're religious or not, they are worshiping their work or their success of vocation. They're not worshiping whoever they think they're worshiping. Um, so it's vitally important that we, we allow only our own programming that we choose, that we decide to embrace in our own hour of power, because the hour of power is glorious and it's, it's so impactful. If, if you think you're not addicted to something, then stop using it for three days. And if you can do that without too much hardship, we're not addicted. But if you can't do that, it's probably something you're allowing in your hour of power, whether it's video games, whether it's news. A lot of people are addicted to news. Um, a lot of people addicted to sports. A lot of people addicted to entertainment. So many people addicted to entertainment. And I'll tell you, it, it is so freeing to let yourself be the master over these things, not to let these things master you, but to allow you to be the master of these things. So that hour of power is, is something that is so important for us to understand. And as we understand it, um, we can really start directing our own lives. And uh, beyond that, you know, Drake taught me another really cool principle. This one is the principle of the pointed finger that um, as we, we find fault in others, as we find problems in others, as we, as we point a finger at someone, we're directing our energy towards that item but we're, or that person, that being. We're directing that same energy up to God, and then we're directing three times that energy back at ourselves. So for us to point out a negative in someone else, we're essentially taking on three times that negative energy inwardly on ourselves, we're pointing that finger three times stronger back at ourselves energetically and um it's a simple little principle but it, the idea of that is to not be pointing out faults or weaknesses in others because to do so is to try to hide three times the faults or weaknesses in oneself and when you can start pointing out blessings and beauty and and um just beautifulness that you can find beauty in the universe, beauty in life, um, great talents and attributes and skills of other people. As you point out these good things, you essentially are taking on three times that good energy towards oneself. Um, but a simple little principle, um, he called it the principle of the pointed finger. And, uh, you know, these are just, just a few of the, the things that he taught me in the process. You know, he, uh, it was a long journey. I was, I was in a coma for three days as I, I was making my journey to heaven. I finally got to heaven and I actually got to experience heaven. And I got to experience an existence I didn't know was possible. An existence that's so full of life and so full of light that, that I'm forever charged off of this experience. That I'm forever changed just off of understanding or contemplating just grass there let alone everything else that I got to see there. But, but there is a real place of, of heaven, and, and it's a place for all of us. It's not the same heaven for all of us. Um, the really beautiful thing I got to understand is that God has created this system that we get exactly what we need or desire all the way through existence eternally. So when we're ready to graduate out of the classroom, because again, this is the classroom, not the courtroom, and we move forward to the next stage or the next phase of our life, we, we get to take on what, what we're ready for next. And um, does that mean we all go to the same big, you know, cloud and, and hang out with angels and harps and wings? No, not at all. It's, it's very much a real existence there. And we get to keep learning and keep growing and keep creating and creating in such a beautiful way that we're not uh, uh, hindered by, by so many um, resistant forces like we get here. It's just a lot harder to create here than it is there. And, and it's just a beautiful process. As I, I got to heaven though, I got to, to understand that our creator, people can call it, call our creator God or the universe, whatever they're comfortable calling our creator, but our creator's everywhere. And our creator is, is, in all of this that we are experiencing here, 
but our creator is in in everything there and we we can literally feel a conscious love coming from everything in heaven from the grass the trees the flowers the water uh, you you literally feel loved just existing near this and you feel so loved and i i didn't feel worthy of that love i had a lot of weaknesses i still do but i didn't feel worthy but yet it was still poured upon me despite my worth or value it was just poured upon me through through amazing grace and love from from god the creator and as i experienced this whole um this whole place of heaven i heard my my guide kind of slow things down for me in our progress and he he kind of got my my attention and and brought my attention down to a point and and said now vinny this is going to be very hard but it's going to be worth it and at this point he took his his presence of who he was and he he gave me a hug and a hug there is so different than hugs here because hugs here were hugs here were it's like taking two bodies and putting them close to each other right well there the hug is like embrace it literally our two energies came together in unison in this hug and as it did i got to feel the most tremendous sense of peace the most tremendous sense of love unconditional love no matter what i ever did in this life it, i still got this love i didn't feel i deserved it but i still was given this and and given this this tremendous sense of how much the creator loves me and and not just me but every single one of us and and i got to catch a glimpse of how much effort went into creating this whole universe and how much effort went into creating all the cosmos and all the laws and the materials and the and the matter come together and organized and 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 put together in a way that it was built for us that all of it was built for us so that we could come to the classroom because i was able to catch a glimpse that in our early early existence before we came to earth we wanted to grow we wanted to to grow and learn how to create but we were so close to god and god's love that anything god wanted we wanted instantly we didn't have a separate thought we didn't have a separate um we didn't have a separate desire separate from god because we're so in sync with that love of god the creator that's when god decided that we needed the big bang we needed the expansion we needed to take these souls that were so close to him and let them go away from home for a while so that they can learn agency they can learn to make their own decisions they can work out their spiritual muscles to use agency to grow and and as we come back we come back different we come back knowing how to make decisions we come back knowing how to have independent thought even though we're right there with god we can still have independent thought but before we separated from god we couldn't cuz we are so in sync with with that love frequency that god is and as i'm feeling all of this happen to me i felt like i was going to melt i really did i felt like who i was was just so enveloped in this love and then i felt the the separation i felt the separation from drake from from god the creator i felt the separation from my experience and and to me where i was the next second i woke up and this is now this is 3 days later after my experience i woke up in the hospital i woke up at 111 in the morning um i didn't remember any of it though i woke up and the only thing i could remember when i first woke up was i am claustrophobic <laughs> I just woke up feeling like ah I felt like I was screaming and yelling and I was pulling tubes out of my mouth I was pulling tubes out of my nose I was pulling tubes out of my other orifices I had them everywhere and I just pulled them all out I I even pulled the gown the hospital gown off me and I just stood there just stood there and took some deep breaths I 
I, I stood there and started doing my 333. I didn't know that's what I was doing. But I stood there and started just breathing deeply and counting my breaths. And, and then realized, wow, I'm in a hospital. How did I get here? I didn't remember how I got there. I didn't remember my experience. I just knew that I had, I had, uh, I was going to my buddy's house. That's the last thing I remembered. And then I woke up into my, into the hospital bed or into the hospital room. So the first thing I do is I, I'm like, I got to get out of here. I don't know why, but I feel like I have to get out of here. So I grabbed, I grabbed a hospital gown, like wrapped around my midsection and I bolted. I literally took off running took off running down the hall towards an elevator. I got all the way to the elevator. I was hitting the down button because we were on a higher floor. I was hitting the down button. And as I'm hitting the down button, I hear a scream. And the scream was coming from the room I just left. <laughs> and uh, so I look back there and I'm like, oh crap. I'm sitting there hitting the down button, down button. I hear the elevator ding like it's coming up. And then I heard another lady scream. And then both of them came out of the room and they were looking both directions and saw me. And then they screamed again. Both of them did. And then I, I knew I was toast. I knew I had to go. I had to go go with these ladies that, you know, I was going to be in trouble if I left. So, so I did. They, they got a security guard and make me, made me stay in the room. They wanted to put all this, the sensors back on me. I wouldn't have it. The only thing I'd allow was I allowed one of these little cups to go, you know, not even a cup. It was not one of these cups. It was like a little sensor they would tape on your finger. And so they were taping this sensor on my finger. That's the only thing I would allow on me. And even that, um, I felt like I wanted to pull off. I just, I felt like it, I couldn't have things touching me after that experience. Now, uh, finally, after, you know, meeting with every different department in the hospital, everybody kept telling me I was the miracle boy, that I was dead and somehow I was still alive. And everybody thought I was brain dead. And and, you know, come to find out for three days, I was essentially mostly brain dead while I was in a coma. And I just, I literally miraculously woke up. And, you know, other than, uh, you know, no residual effects other than I had to end up replacing all my molars because the molars in the, in the process of doing the seizures, I had hyperfractured all the molars so that over the years, they just came apart one at a time, sometimes two at a time. Um, but that was really the only lingering effect from the whole experience was, you know, um, slowly replacing the molars over the years. But the very next day, uh, you know, after I, I got released from the hospital, I made him release me at about 7 a.m. the following morning. Um, I left. My dad came to get me. I, I left and took, took the day off and I went to work the next day. But as soon as I got home that day from the hospital, I went jogging. I felt fine. I didn't feel like I even had any congestion in the in the the lungs or the heart or anything and I, I felt like I was back to normal then the following day went to work um, and my sister wanted to take me out to dinner that night and kind of kind of give me the third degree of what happened to me and so I went to dinner with her and she she did give me the third degree she finally cornered me and said hey you know you were dead right and, and I'm like yeah that's what everybody tells me everybody you know Everybody's calling me the miracle boy. And I, I didn't feel like a miracle. I felt like the cursed kid, not a miracle boy. The way that it was, ex I was experiencing it, I still couldn't understand why I was so claustrophobic. I'd never been claustrophobic like that before. And then she asked me, she said, hey, did you have an out-of-body experience? Because you were definitely dead. They, they all say you were dead for a good time, a good amount of time. Did you have an out-of-body experience? And in my mind, I went to form the words no. And I went to go say no, but what came out of my mouth was, I have a guide, his name's Drake. And then I started, I started just relaying my whole experience. And what's so weird to me is I felt like it was almost like something came over me and all of a sudden this experience was coming out of me. And then I, as it was coming out of me, I realized that, it, that I was remembering all this. And, and not only was I remembering it, I remembered it vividly. And in my own mind, I could go back and, and actually revisit all of this, this whole experience. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a very analytical type person. So even though this happened to me and all of a sudden I had this whole experience just kind of dumped down in my consciousness, I'm, I went to go meet with some, some professionals to see if maybe this, this was just a delusion. Was this my brain just trying to make some things up? And as I went to meet with one of these professionals, uh, 
I had an experience where I just had, I had certain knowledge come to me um, about the actual uh, doctor that I was meeting with. And I shared that knowledge with the doctor. And later in a way, he explained to me that, you know, everything that I was sharing with him was in true fact. And that whatever happened to me had to be real because these certain knowledges that I had were things that even he had forgotten about from when he was a little boy. And, and it was just a confirmation to me that, that my experience and the, the other things that have come to me since are, are in, in fact, real things. And, you know, I, I explain it in my book. Later, I actually get to find out who Drake is. It's only months after I come back, I meet this amazing girl. We get engaged. And right before we get married, I actually end up finding out who Drake was and who he is in, my, in the real world, not, not in the spirit world, like in this world, who he was. And I get to find out a lot more about him later in my life and, and realize that you know, it was part of his purpose too, to uh, be a guide for his loved ones and his ancestors to, to help them cross over, cross from, from the physical world into the eternal world. And, and overall, it was just an absolutely amazing experience where, where I was able to realize that this whole system is built out of so much light and built out of so much love that we have no idea that behind the curtain, there's all these forces working in our behalf, working to help us succeed. And the ones that are working against us is us, just us. And we are our own worst enemy in this world, in this universe. And, and you know, I hope that if I can uh, bring any, anything to anybody with my experience through my story is I hope that it can bring a glimmer of hope and bring bring a glimmer of light in a time where there's not a lot of hope and not a lot of light because you know, this too shall pass what's going on in the world right now. It, this too shall pass. But what really matters is that we understand that we're not in a courtroom. We're in a classroom that there's no passing or failing. It's more about what can we learn? How can we help others? How can we help ourselves? Um, how can we really embody the, the love and the light of God, the creator in our own world, in our own life? Uh, and, you know, learning how to honor and respect the hour of power, learning how important that 30 to 60 minutes when we first wake up is and learning how important the last 30 to 60 minutes before we go to bed is. When we learn these, these important powers, we learn these important priorities we do realize that we are the masters of our own destiny. We are the builders of our own universe. And that's what I hope to get across. I'm sorry, I'm a, a bit long-winded here, Jess. Sorry, man. <laughs> I, I, got, I get a little, I, get, I go a little off when I, I tell the story, but man, I'm, I'm telling you, it's such a, a powerful experience for me. I mean, I'm the one who had the experience and it still truly impacts me. And, and what's really cool is years and years and years later, I've had so many confirmations of my experience that, you know, for, for a while, I actually did think, you know, you're crazy. This is just your brain being delusional. It's trying to fill in the gaps of the missing information. And, uh, you know, with, after so many confirmations, I can't deny it. I can't deny it. It's not possible that it's a delusion anymore, that um, it is 100% what happened to me. Is it something that everybody should read? No, absolutely not. It's not a story for everybody. But I'm telling you if, you, if you could use some hope, if you could use some, some guidance, some spiritual guidance, or if you could use um, uh, an ability to better master your hour of power, then this book is, is perfect for you. Because it's not, it's not only got that, it's got a little bit more. It's got a lot of information there to, to help people so that they can be the masters of their own universe. They can be the masters of their own dominion, their own, their own destiny. Vinny, thank you for sharing your experience with us. <laughs> In the beginning, when this light came to the Ricky paramedic, do you think mm -hmm. that was God, as you mentioned, or do you think that was Drake? So um, I think it was one in the same. I think that it was God's power. I really feel it was God's power. I felt the force, the strength of it as it like went over my shoulder. But I feel it was Drake guiding that power or directing that power. I feel that that power was kind of um, uh, harnessed or, or 
channeled by Drake himself so that 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 could be fulfilled by Drake. But I feel that if Drake didn't show up, that, that another angel would or someone, an angel would to to facilitate what needed to happen. But I do feel um, there was absolute divine order in it. That's one thing that I really picked up there that that when something needs to happen, if we don't do what we're supposed to do, God will come to someone else to make sure they do it. So, you know, sometimes we feel prompting. Sometimes we feel like we're supposed to do something. We have a mission. We have a destiny. If we don't fulfill that destiny, God will still get it done. It's just, um, he'll get it, you know, the creator will get it done with someone else or, or something else. And I feel that for sure with that, though, with the medic, having that light, that, that energy glow around him, I feel it was definitely God's love, God's light that was there. But I almost like Drake was holding the flashlight, but the flashlight was God, if that makes sense. Yeah. Then would you think it was Drake that was telling him he's not dead yet? Yes. Yeah, it could have been Drake for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you actually saw in heaven? Like, did you see like, yes. a beautiful garden or? So um, the, the coolest thing was when I touched down in heaven, first thing I perceived was, well, as we approached heaven, I could see it was actually a planet. I could see that this, this heaven of place, this heaven of sorts was a true planet, a planet that's so vast that you could fit easily a million earths inside of it. It's huge, just much, much larger than our planet much larger than our sun. And, and this planet of heaven, it doesn't have an external sun. So there's not like an outside sun shining light on it. The light actually comes from within the living creatures and plants and beings on the planet. So the, the, the beings themselves have light coming out of them, emitting out of them. So color seems very, very different there. And the reason it does, because, you know, the way we discover color here is color is light hitting an object and reflecting, right? And we're seeing that reflection. That's what color is to us here. But color there is light emitting out of these, these things. And it, for instance, grass. Grass there, there's probably like 3 million different greens you could see in the grass, just the grass alone. And the grass itself had like a, had like a sweet smell. It, had, it emitted like a musical tone out of it. And as I touched down and actually like touched the grass with my toes, I actually could plug into this loving consciousness that was the grass. And I could perceive that it was all affiliated with, with all the other aspects of heaven. And that it was like this network of, of loving energy and that it wanted the best for me. And it loved me. It loved every every fiber of my being, even with all the, the big mistakes I've made in my life, it still loved me unconditionally. And it was just such a beautiful thing. And, and that was just the grass. I mean, I got to experience the flowers. I got to experience water. Water was so healing. The water, you would get near it and the water would ask, would you like, to, uh, would you like me to be upon you? And you'd say yes. And the water would just come up you, but it wouldn't get you wet but it would cleanse you everywhere it touched. It would remove any, any energetic harm or, or programming that had happened in your life. It would remove it. It would remove kind of like the harm that life throws at you or you allow to be programmed in you as you grow and live in this world. And it just would heal you. It would wash away the, the hardest of hardships that you could have ever endured in your life. And uh, then it would get done and you'd feel renewed. And, and again, you could sense like this sweetness, this, this savoriness coming from the water. And it too had a smell, a beautiful aroma and, and had a, a liquid like sound um, emitting off of it, like a music. It was just very much interactive. It, it felt like 6D or 7D, you know how we have 3D and 4D um, experiences it felt like sixth dimension, seventh dimension. Like, felt like there's so much more that I experienced with these things that we don't get to experience here. Um, and then, then I did see this building. I saw this like lake, this little lake, and I saw these trees. I was able to 
you know, use the grass to plug in and actually connect to the trees, which was really a beautiful experience to understand the power of community and the power of, of interlocking uh, energies like trees do. And then uh, from there, I got pulled, pulled back and, and I got to see this big, vast building that looked like four or five stories tall, um, all white marble, had these beautiful columns. But instantly I knew that the, the entire building was made out of a single piece of marble, the entire building, like one piece of marble. And that if you wanted to go in a room, you had to match the, the love frequency of that room. And then an opening would just form and you'd be able to walk in. But if you couldn't match that love frequency, then the building would guide you to a room that you could match the frequency. Um, but there was no doors. There was no doors on any of the building. You would just be able to, you were allowed in rooms. You could, you could maybe raise your frequency or, or allow your frequency to get to. And I use the word frequency because that's a term we use here. But it really, the, when I use the word frequency, I mean the love energy. When you could match the love energy of what was correct for that room, you were allowed in. And what I was taught is this entire building was like a school that we're very passionate about our learning that, you know, even after we die, we can continue to learn and learn anything we want in the universe. And that's what this place is. It's a place of learning if we want to go there, but we don't have to go there. We have these other um, dome like features that were over to the right side, over on the other side of the pond and all these domes, there's hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of them. These are our special domes for decompressing trauma. So what will happen is spirits will go from our existence here. We want to cross over and be in heaven, but we can't make it all the way. So we end up in these domes, these half, half, um, half sphere domes on the, on the planet itself to kind of decompress. And then, and then earlier, I didn't tell you this um, earlier, but as I was approaching that planet, I saw these other orbs and these other orbs would be the only, the only hell that exists in that experience were these orbs. And they weren't orbs of hell. They were orbs where people went to um, release their own internal hell. So they would go, they would have like, maybe somebody has this idea that they're a victim and they can't release their victimness or their victimhood from their, from their life energy. And because they can't release it, they go inside one of these orbs, which these orbs are built out of love. They go inside until they can decompress, till they can release this energy of being a victim. And the second they get to the end of that energy and they let it go, then there's all this love that surrounds them. And then boom, it takes them to the heaven space or to the heaven planet where they can continue their progress, whether it's in one of these other domes or go to the school. There's also um, a place where, you know, if people, if their favorite era was like the 70s, their favorite era was like the 80s, the 90s, different parts of the world. This planet's so vast that you can go to this like idealized space where you can um, kind of live out your 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 happy times or your happy period. And for some people, that's their way of decompressing. That's their way of getting in the right space so that they can start creating. They can start uh, being creators themselves. So what's really beautiful about it though is the love energy that's there is literally creating a path individual to the individual so we're going to get exactly what each one of us needs so that we can become the best creator we can become the best um, engineer the best uh, teacher the best learner the best student the best whatever we want to be and and that's what it's all about is you know god the creator is our cheerleader and wants us to do the best possible with what we're given and and then and then even go further and that's what it's all about. The whole energy there is all about that is, is taking what's given and, and going even further with it. It's, it's just a beautiful space really is. It's hard to, it's hard to use words to describe it because it's, it's an experience outside of words. It's an experience that literally you can't use words to truly describe it and get the description correct. The building that had columns on it, did it look kind mm -hmm. of like ancient Roman or ancient Greek at all? It did. So, um, so it looked like the ancient Rome, not necessarily the Greek, because it had these big spire columns and they're huge. 
and they went like four or five stories tall. Uh, in between, though, you could tell there's all these classrooms inside this building, but there was no windows or doors to get through to them. But here's what's really cool. You could see the different light energy glowing through the different classrooms. And it, the, the marble itself was almost like opalescent. Like you could see light coming through certain parts of it. And um, uh, pearlescent or opalescent where where you literally saw light coming through it. It was, yeah, it's just so hard because words can't describe it really. They can't describe what this building was like. And it was one solid piece of marble, the entire building. And the, the building itself had a love consciousness to it that ran the whole thing. It's kind of funny. The, the closest thing I can come to in description is if you're familiar with the Harry Potter series, um, the, what they call the room of requirement. That's what it's like. It's kind of like you're, you get exactly what you need out of this building individually, not, not collectively, like individually, we get everything we need out of this building. It's pretty cool. Pretty amazing. Was there a room or a place anywhere in the columned building that was like records, like what people may say where the Akashic records are? Yeah. So, so this building was really, really long. And if you went off to the far right, that's what was perceived to me as like the hall of records. So there is like a place of records, but here's the funny thing that they showed me that the DNA here is the hall of records here. So everything that can ever happen in this universe is, is recorded in our DNA here so that we can take our DNA here, take it there, and we can actually unlock anything that's ever happened in our universe here. So um, there's, you know, we, we think very linearly with our minds, like there's a beginning, a middle and an end, but there, there's no time. Time, time is something that was created just for the third dimension so that we could perceive time. That's why it was created so that we could take all this, this growth and learning and kind of pinpoint it into these periods, but really to them, to the spirit side, um, whether it's the year 300 or the year 3000 to, to them, it's all happening now. Like literally it's all happening now. So there's not like a beginning, middle and end. It's all happening at the same time to them. And, um, yeah, there's, there's, it's weird. It's again, it's hard to describe, but it's, uh, such a cool thing though, that, yeah, there's a hall of records for sure. And that hall of records, if you, if you get into meditation, you can actually go to this hall of records. You can access these things. Um, but again, you have to get to that love frequency. You can't go there with this. I'm going to get this information so I can really go after this people or go after this topic or go after this. We have to come with like the most clean, positive, loving energy. And as we do so, we can actually access this space. We can access the space from here, from the low third dimension, by going diving deep inside ourselves. Because inside our holy temples, our temples right here, we can access the eternities. We can access heaven. We can access angels. We can access God. We can access our creator and access um, the masters, the, the ascended masters, those who have, have really mastered certain aspects of this life and moved on to the eternities, we can access them and, 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 and how to help others with getting access to them, yeah. At any point, was reincarnation ever discussed? And if not, <laughs> and if you don't do that, do you stay there or go on to other planets or what? So here's where... Here's where sometimes I ruffle feathers. I can only be authentic to my experience that um, that I, I have to honor what is true, okay? And the truth is, is there multiple lives? Yes. But also, is there a system where someone comes here, only lives once, and then goes to heaven? Yes, absolutely. So it's, it, it's not the same rule for everybody. Everybody has a different path. But I do know for a fact that certain beings um, who, who work specifically for God have been here for thousands of lifetimes, that they go through these lifetimes as, as um, 
workers for God, working for God. And so th- for them, they've got thousands of lifetimes. Is that the path for all of us? No, it's not necessarily the path for all of us. But is it possibly the path for some of us? Yes. Now, I do know for a fact that certain individuals that I'm closely connected to, that this is their first and only life here in the, the third dimension existence. And that after this, once they move forward, they're not going to come back. But at the same time, at the same right, there's others that I'm also very connected to that this isn't their first life, that they have had multiple lives. So but here's the thing. This is a question that is only important to yourself. This isn't a question that's important to anyone else. The, the path that's important for you is you. That's it. And, you know, I get pastors that come after me on this. I get people from my own church that come after me on this. And I, I can only say the truth, what I experience. And I know for a fact that there is multiple lives for some, but not for everybody. It, there's certain people that they come here for one lifetime and then they move forward. But also uh, a lot of times when people go through past life regression, they do hypnosis to try to figure out what their past lives are. Sometimes what they're picking up is not a past life, but it was a job, a time where they were a guide or a guardian for someone who was living. And they were, they were working as angels or, or spirit workers to try to help this person. So they experienced things that this person experienced, but they didn't experience the whole existence. And there's a way to kind of dissect that and understand if, you, if you're doing past life regression, if it was truly a past life or if it was a past duty where you were, you were facilitating someone else's life for them, helping them essentially. So were you a guardian for an ancestor or for uh, Marie Antoinette or for Mother Teresa or for who knows, you know, for the, the Queen of Sheba, it doesn't matter. Um, you, there's ways to find that out for sure. But the, the funny thing is the only important person you need to, need to find that out for is for yourself. That's it. Find out for yourself if that's your path. It, it's not the path of everyone to have all these lives, but it's also not the path of everyone to only have one. Um, everybody has their own individualistic life. And I know for a fact that God has created this system. The creator created this system that if we don't get what we need out of this, we're allowed the agency to come back again and learn some more if we need to. Um, it's not the path of everybody though. Definitely not the path of everybody. Yeah. You keep mentioning the agency and I'm not clear on that. What is the agency? So here's the funny thing. Agency is a two edged sword agency allows us to make our choices. We get to choose what energy we embrace. You know, like we get to choose what we put in our body food wise. We get to choose what we put in our body energy wise with our eyes and with our ears. We also get to choose those who we allow around us in our circle of friends. We get to choose the cars we drive. We get to choose the, the jobs we take. And in doing all these choosing, we start to see patterns start showing up. We start to see um, by their fruits, you shall know them. So we get to start to see the fruits growing around these different choices, if that makes sense. So you start to see who the soul is by all these choices as they line up. But again, this is not a courtroom. It's a classroom, right? So there's not a failing grade. There's only how much do we want to grow? We want to grow a little? Do we want to grow a lot? So the more agency we allow ourselves to have, the more growth we can have. The less agency we allow ourselves to have, the less growth we have. But here's the, the, the two sides of that sword. Whenever you have a system full of agency, you also have a system full of the potential for harm. Because as long as we can make free choices, free agent choices, choices to do good or bad, those who choose to do bad specifically to children and to, to, you know, as they victimize other human beings and animals, that agency is still so important that we can't remove agency, even from bad people. Um, because when we, you know, if somebody makes bad decisions, they go to jail. That's, that's a fruit of their labor, right? They, they make bad decisions. They go to jail. They lose that agency in this world because of their bad decisions. But if we make, you know, kind of bad decisions, but kind of good decisions, we're, we're kind of um, 
uh, not really getting wet, but but yet we're not really swimming, and and we're so we're we ourselves are not progressing eternally. It's through our choices that we're able to progress, and so agency is really important, and that does mean that there is going to be the potential for extreme mistakes to happen. That you know, as long as we have agency, there's the potential for Hitler's to exist, but there's also the potential for Mother Teresa's to exist, and I would be. I would be one to say that if you really knew the hearts of mankind, you would understand there's far more Mother Teresa's out there than there ever was Hitler's. But there's always going to be Hitler's if, as long as we have the agency to make our own choices. And that, that is a vital part of our growth. Because, if, again, if we remove agency, there's no reason to even be here right now. Because we didn't, we felt like we had agency when we were near God and with our creator. But that power that God is, is so strong. Everything that God wanted, we wanted. We were in such syncopation with God. We love God so much that we wanted everything God wanted. So we couldn't have that ability to make our own choices. We had to go a far distant from God where we couldn't even remember where we came from so that we could learn to make choices, learn to make decisions. And to me, it's like going to the gym. We had to go to the spiritual gym so that we could make choices to lift our weights. We could lift with our agency and build those spiritual muscles, those muscles of making choices. And after we've done that long enough and we've done it in the right way long enough, we can go back to the presence of God and say, now I've mastered it. Now I've, I, I can know who I really am. Look at all these decisions I made when you weren't even there, God. You weren't there you know, right next to me, but I still made all these good decisions. Look at what I'm able to create now, even when I'm near you. So, so it's, it's literally mastering the power of choice is mastering the power of creation because our choices do turn into creations. And, and to me, it starts with thought. We really have to master our thoughts because our thoughts become our actions. Our actions become our habits. Our habits become our character. And our character becomes our destiny. So it starts with the thoughts. If we can control our thoughts, if we can, we can um, garner our thoughts, when we can control those thoughts, we can control our destiny, period. Super, super simple, but it starts with thought. Yeah. You mentioned that you're going to church. I'm assuming that you're Christian. And if so, where does Jesus fit into all this? So what's really cool is Jesus and the Christ consciousness is the love that we can feel of God here. So the way that we actually can feel God's love and and connect to God's love here is through Jesus Christ, through the Christ consciousness. Does that mean that people have to become Christian to return to live with God? No, they can embody the Christ consciousness and and eventually they're able to learn what that is and they can accept Christ and, and return to him. But they don't have to do it necessarily through Christianity. The, the one thing that's funny for a lot of people to understand about heaven is I saw people in heaven that came from all over the world, from all over different time periods, different faiths. There was Romans there, Greeks there, Islam, Hindu, um, of course, Christianity, um, there was, there's all these different faiths there. And what's funny is I did see like a off to the side heaven for only Christians. Right. But it was a, a heaven removed from God. And what this side heaven was for was for the Christians who couldn't accept that there was other religions in heaven. And, and, and what's weird is this other side heaven was actually distanced from God because God, the creator of all creation, loves all of his creations, loves them all. No matter what their religion is, as long as they're discovering his light and connecting to his light in their own religion, they're connecting to him. So he does have a lot more followers than, than we would be led to believe through our religion. Um, the religions are trying to <clears throat> build boxes around the rainbow of God. And God is the real rainbow. What happens when you build a box around a rainbow? You shut out the light. And it doesn't exist in there anymore. And that's what's happened with a lot of these religions. They've tried to put walls around God. And you can't put walls around God. God is far greater 
God's God's greater than being a man or a woman or a human. God is God is the creator of this entire universe. So God is all of the above. The creator is everything in this universe. And to to dumb God down to being this this kind of egotistical conditional loving being that says, "Oh, well, I love you as long as you're going to church or you're doing what I tell you to do." is is a little bit asinine and here's why it's asinine because if i as a human parent love my kids way more than that i love my kids so much that i don't care what they do i still am going to love them i don't care the decisions they make i don't care the performance that they do with good behavior bad behavior i still love that i love the heck out of my kids and nothing can change that and that's the love of a human parent now, if you multiply that by eons and eons of, of times to understand that God, the creator of the universe, loves us far more than the best human parent can ever love us, then you start to understand that the love of God is so strong. It loves all of us, no matter how we were raised, no matter what culture, no matter what lifestyle, no matter what we choose, God loves every single one of us. And there's nothing we can do that would lessen that love. There's no bad decision I can make that would make God love me any less than God already loves me. And it goes the same for all of us. Would it be correct to say that any person of any religion or no religion at all can still access the Christ consciousness? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what is the Christ consciousness? The Christ consciousness is the ability to go outside oneself the way Christ did to selflessly, lovingly serve others, that is the Christ consciousness. That's the love that God has for us. Because God does love every single hair on on every single one of our heads. God loves every fiber of who we are in the physical dimension, but the eternities too. God loves us so much that God wants us to have God as a presence in our lives. So if we want to call that uh, the universe, if we want to call that Hare Krishna or, or, or Muhammad or Buddha or whatever we want to call it, it doesn't matter. What God wants is a personal connection with us. So where do we go to find that personal connection to God? The funny thing is we go the exact opposite of the direction of what all these religions teach us. All these religions say you need to go to the mosque. You got to go to the temple. You got to go to the church. You got to go to the Wat. You got to go to all these religious holy sites to discover God. But in fact, the key to the universe is in our holy temple right here between our two temples. That's the holy space that we can find really God, the creator of the universe, the creator of us. And how do we access that? There's so many different ways. Um, But first and foremost is love. Love is the way. Love is the key to access the the Christ consciousness in our holy temple. And we don't have to be a Christian. We don't have to be a Buddhist. We don't have to be a Hindu. We can be any religion that we want. But we need to really seek out that love within our own religion to connect to the creator. Now, every religion does have a strong amount of fear energy a strong amount of judgment energy. And that's actually where we're not going to find God. We're not going to find God over there kicking ass and taking names. We're going to find God loving us and taking names. That's where we're going to find God. So we really got to seek God out in the holiest of spaces right there and not just show up to the dump and start shoving things in, allowing garbage in our eyes and our ears and our mouths. It's important that we understand that, that the world has built a system that it keeps our temples full of garbage. It does. So that we can't connect to God. And we don't have to do that. We, we can choose what, what we allow in our hour of power. We get to choose. You mentioned your book. What is it called and where can we find it? Well, Amazon is the, probably the easiest place. We, the book is called The Light After Death. You can go to our website, thelightafterdeath.com. So it's available there. We just send you to Amazon to get it. But yeah, thelightafterdeath.com. Essentially, 
over the years, you know, it's been almost 20 years. So coming this January 18th, it will be 20 years since my experience. In the 20 years that I've been working and sharing this experience verbally and now written in my book, um, I've been building this community, uh, a community of light. And um, I call it Living God's Light is the community. And, and that's another .com if you want to look that one up, livinggodslight.com. It's a gathering of like-minded souls who want to build light in the universe. They want to build light in each other. They want to do, kind of discover the inner Mother Teresa in all of us. So, uh, you know, discover the Christ consciousness in all of us and help um, shine that light and strengthen the power of light on earth versus the, the power of darkness that is everywhere. Everywhere you go, man. Uh, you know, Jeff, you get to see the power of fear everywhere you go nowadays. Um, fear sells and fear is easily marketed. And that's why you see it everywhere is it's just good marketing. And if we didn't click, if we didn't purchase, when we saw these fearful things, we would start to understand that we are in power, um, not our fears and not our, our lower, lower indulgences. So, yeah, so um, the, the community is called um, Living God's Light. And then the book itself is called thelightafterdeath.com. Available on Amazon right now. We recorded an audible about a month and a half ago. So that one should be showing up in the next few weeks. Uh, maybe by Christmas for sure, we see Audible coming out on it too. So I'm excited to share it with the world. Like I've always said, it's not a message for everybody, but those who need it, it, it really resonates with them. And I'm excited to see the changes that people have experienced as they learn this information. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you. Are you up for that? Sure. Absolutely. They can reach out um, through the the Living God's Light community. There is a contact page there. Um, they can reach out there. We are, uh, we do, I have a process where I actually do coaching for people on uh, a regular basis. If they would like to do some personal coaching, I have a process for setting that up. They can go through the application process through livinggodslight.com. Um, and then we also do a retreat a couple times a year where we gather some of these like-minded individuals and we have what I like to term peak life experiences where we, we allow yourself to have four or five or six days straight of just really good experiences with like-minded individuals and realize that you're not alone, that you can be a beacon of light out in the world and really let that light shine to everybody. And you're safe to do so because you have your tribe, you have your, your, your family of light that we are together. Um, and making a difference in our own little communities, uh, making a, a big difference. So yeah, that's the way they can do it is through livinggodslight.com. You, you can email through there and, and they'll send the, uh, the application. Yeah. All right, Vinny, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Absolutely. So here's, here's something that I like to say to everybody before I end a, a podcast when I remember is if you've struggled to about self-worth if you've struggled whether you're important whether your life matters i want you to know if you're if you're listening to this right now that your life does matter that that god does love you the creator does love you if you don't believe in a god then then let your let your own mind say the universe loves you to to god it doesn't matter whether you call god god or creator or universe it doesn't matter um, but just know that the universe does love you, that you do matter, and that, that the creator loves you exactly how you are right now. Not who you want to be, not who you ideally could be, but who you are sitting right there listening to this right now. That's exactly how God loves you right now. And God wouldn't change anything in you because we all are here to learn and how do we learn is to make mistakes to have our agency to be imperfect that's how we're able to learn and god loves us in our imperfection because even in our imperfection we are perfection for god because we're doing exactly what we've been designed to do come here and make choices use our agency to learn and and again i want to reiterate that god loves you exactly how you are right now and, and despite what religions tell you your value is, 
your value is extremely precious because right now I want you to understand that you are a divine masterwork. That the powers of the universe came together to create you and put you in existence right where you are right now. And if you fully understood the powers that had to come together just to create you, you would be in awe of how important you are to God and to this universe. So recognize that you are important. Um, every single one of you, if you're listening to this right now, know that you are. And, and that's the best message I can leave with you is, you know, with all your imperfections, because of all your imperfections, God loves you. Every single fiber of your being, that's it. Vinny, thank you for that message. And thank you again for being my guest. I wish you a great rest of your evening. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's awesome to chat with you, bro. And, and thank you so much for this, this, uh, this channel, for this ability to get outside the system, essentially, and, and kind of see a different view of things. And thank you for all that you do, brother. I really appreciate you, man. And I appreciate your kind feedback. Have a great night. You too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.